I'm Jim Baxter, and this is Lecture 7, Life Histories for General Ecology. As this cartoon suggests, organisms have a specific schedule of life events that they go through. For this insect, its schedule, listed here as today's agenda, dictates that it will emerge from its cocoon, eat, mate, and die. <laughs> not, uh, you know, not a very exciting uh, life from our standpoint, but, um, and of course this is overly simplified to be sure, but, but this cartoon points to the fact that there are a number of key events that occur in an organism's lifetime that are essential for its survival and reproduction, and therefore for its persistence. For the organism, the nature and timing of these events are themselves adaptations selected for by natural selection. The particular combination of traits for any particular species represents the best solution to the challenge of producing the largest possible number of surviving offspring given the pre prevailing environmental uh, conditions in which it lives. If we look across the diverse forms of life on Earth, we see that each organism has a different schedule of life events and allocates energy differently to growth, maintenance, and reproduction. From large animals like whales and elephants, and even you and I, that have long lifespans, produce few offspring, and invest a lot of energy into growth and structures that protect it from competitors and predators, to annual plants that have short lifespans, produce many offspring and invest very little in protective structures or parental care of offspring. Different species show characteristic patterns in the kinds of adaptations that govern these characteristics and these are shaped by natural selection. The combination of traits that govern the schedule of these life events for an organism is called its life history. Life history theory posits that the schedule and duration of key events in an organism's lifetime are shaped by natural selection to produce the largest number of surviving offspring in its environment. Because life history traits directly affect an organism's ability to produce surviving offspring, that is, of course, its fitness, life history traits are all in some way or another related to an organism's capacity to reproduce. Thought of another way, each species represents a unique evolutionary solution, that is, to the problem of effectively allocating limited time, energy, and resources to growth, maintenance, and ultimately reproductive success. To begin our discussion of life histories, we first need to talk about the problem of allocation of time and energy. The basic tenet of life history theory is that organisms have limited time and energy to put into these different functions, growth, maintenance, and, and reproduction. That is, energy used for one function or purpose cannot be used for another. What are some of the trade-offs that organisms face as they balance the need for growth, maintenance, and reproduction? As shown here in these, these figures, um, on the left, this, this tree, um, you know, the energy that this tree is spent on protective structures like bark can't be used for new growth. Uh, that energy has been expended. Likewise, in these penguins, the energy time, energy and time spent mating uh, can't be used for feeding. So I, I think you get the idea. Um, there are a couple of other examples here, um, like in this plant species, all of those seeds um, that are coming out of that pod, um, the energy going into those can't be used for defense and so on. Therefore, the basic idea of life history theory is, which, which logically flows from the laws of thermodynamics, is the principle of allocation. That is, time and energy spent on one function can't be used for another. You can kind of think about this like, you know, trying to get ahead while living within a budget. In order to get ahead, you, you have to make good decisions about how to spend your limited resources. This piggy bank shows what you probably already know about your own finances. If you spend money on paying bills, that money is not available to spend on a car or going out to dinner or seeing a movie. In the case of life history, the organism's budget is the amount of energy available to it, and how organisms allocate those limited resources is determined by natural selection. 
So what is a life history trait? Well, uh, I just list a few examples here of life history traits. They all play an essential role in determining the reproductive output of an organism, and therefore its success, as well as that of the population. Things like the number and size of offspring, the age at first reproduction, the amount of parental investment, and, and the reproductive lifespan, these all vary dramatically among different species, and they have important effects on the organism's fitness, um, yet there are a number of trade-offs that exist regarding um, how energy is allocated to these different types of traits. Let's take a look. As we've discussed, the principle of allocation dictates that energy used for one thing cannot be used for another. Thus, you wouldn't find an organism that, that can maximize energy allocation to all aspects of fitness simultaneously. Um, this kind of hypothetical organism has been called a Dar our Darwinian demon, of course, after Charles Darwin. A Darwinian demon is, is simply a hypothetical organism that could reproduce directly after being born, produce infinitely many offspring, and live indefinitely. Of course, an organism like this doesn't exist, um, and uh, but you know, as as a hypothetical organism, it would be completely unrestrained or unconstrained by by evolution, and so could um, allocate energy to all of these different um, aspects that would allow it to maximize fitness. But in in, in real organisms, uh, there are trade-offs, and thus the life history strategy of a species reflects these trade-offs, and those will ultimately affect its overall fitness, and thus its success. Now, by, by strategy, I don't mean to imply that the species has some, you know, grand plan. Instead, the word strategy is often used because the combination of life history traits represents kind of the best solution um, that's evolved through natural selection for how the species will maximize the number of surviving offspring in its environment. So let's take a, a look at a couple of examples. In plants, seed size, shape, and number varies tremendously from one species to another. You can see in this picture the tremendous variety of, 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 of shapes, sizes, and colors of, of seeds of different plants. For an, for an example, uh, an, an individual orchid seed is, is as small as two millionths of a gram, whereas seeds of coconut palm are somewhere on the order of 25,000 grams. That's over 10 orders of magnitude difference in size. Uh, so this range of variability is, is tremendous. And whereas, a, so for example, a single orchid plant can produce billions of seeds that are very, very small, a coconut palm produces much smaller numbers. So, yet among this enormous variation, there's an interesting pattern that, that emerges. Um, it's between seed size and seed number. This graph shows the relationship between average seed mass and the number of seeds per plant among species in four different plant families. Across all four families, species that produce larger seeds on average produce fewer. Why is that? Well, let we, we go back to the principle of allocation, which dictates that plants have a limited energy budget that can be allocated to reproduction. Therefore, if the number of seeds produced per plant is large, then each individual seed produced by the plant would have to be small, such that the total amount of energy available is not exceeded. If, on the other hand, each seed is, is large, then to stay within the plant's energy budget, the plant can only produce a limited number of seeds. Clearly, this life history pattern is evident and maintained across a wide range of plant species, as, as shown here in, in the results, looking at seed mass versus um, number of seeds across these plant families. Um, but how is it maintained? There must be fitness advantages and disadvantages between these two different reproductive patterns. So 
what, what are the fitness advantages? Well, um, obviously, as I mentioned, to maintain such a broad pattern of variation, um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages. Let's, let's take a look at those. Um, on the left, for example, um, in, you know, plants that produce many small seeds, what are some of the consequences of that versus producing fewer large seeds? Well, of course, uh, many small seeds, small seeds in general, have very low energy reserves. Um, once they establish, um, or once they, they land in a location, um, they don't have a lot of energy to draw from to build roots to, to um, establish themselves and be competitive in environment. Um, on the other hand, uh, they have very high dispersal, so they can reach a lot of locations, um, you know, kind of in this broad, you know, kind of shotgun approach. Um, most of the seeds don't make it, um, but those that do uh, are able to persist and, and survive in those locations. Uh, of course, without as many energy reserves, these um, small seeds are less competitive, so they tend to be more successful in habitats that are, you know, not very crowded, okay? There's not a lot of competition. On the other hand, um, producing fewer large seeds um, has both some benefits and some drawbacks as well. Um, fewer large seed have se seeds have higher energy reserves. Um, but the trade-off is that because they're larger, they have limited dispersal. So um, they don't tend to disperse as far from the parent plant. Um, but once they do uh, reach a location, um, they're more robust. They have more energy reserves to draw from, to build root structures, to put out their first leaves, and they're also more competitive. So you can see that there are some um, you know, clear trade-offs and that these trade-offs um, are going to affect the fitness of individuals producing these different um, types of strategies for seed production. Um, and that, um, you know, it depends upon the type of environment that they occur in, which we'll talk about in a moment. So plant species that produce many small seeds tend to occur in habitats where um, disturbance rates are high, and thus where resources are fairly unpredictable. Uh, these habitats tend to be more open and less crowded, so there's not a premium on being highly competitive. Having many small seeds, which have high dispersal ability, have the capacity to quickly arrive at these locations that, that become newly opened by disturbance, and they can colonize them very quickly. Though plants that produce large seeds are constrained to produce fewer, um, large seeds have greater energy reserves and can, you know, establish in, in poorer conditions um, and uh, ones that are also more competitive. That is, one in which other species have already established there. Seedlings from larger seeds tend to produce seedlings that survive at a higher rate in the face of competition and predation. So, how does seed size translate into survival? Um, just to drive this point home, a, a study by Jacobson and Erickson, um, in which they grew grassland plants from seeds of different sizes, illustrates the importance of seed size on seedling growth, and ultimately, of course, survival. The results in the, the graph show seed mass versus the mass of the resulting seedling derived from that seed. The significant positive relationship here indicates that on the whole, larger seeds produce larger seedlings. Once those seedlings had germinated, they followed those same seedlings to find out which ones of them were able to establish. This is called recruitment. Um, so you can see on the, the left-hand axis there, um, when in the graph of seed mass versus seedling recruitment, that they followed along the degree to which the seedlings um, recruited uh, based on, on their initial mass. So what they found was that larger seedlings had a higher rate of recruitment into the population. Therefore, it appears that by investing more energy into a seed, 
the maternal plant increases the probability that the seed will successfully establish itself as a new plant. This advantage associated with large seed size is probably a very important environment such as grasslands that were studied by Jacobson and Erickson, where competition with established plants is, is actually pretty high. The, the density of, of different plant individuals in grasslands is very high. And so there's a, there's a premium on being able to um, have some seed reserves to be able to establish in this highly competitive environment. Another example um, that I didn't talk about in, in the lecture uh, is clutch size. Um, and clutch size uh, in birds is an example in animals of the kinds of trade-offs that exist in life history strategy strategies. A clutch is, is simply the number of eggs laid in a single reproductive event by a female bird. Clutch size actually varies quite a bit from one species of bird to the next, but, but tends to be maintained at a certain number within a species and, and in a given habitat. In a study of European magpies, researchers manipulated the size of the clutch of the species and observed how many chicks actually fledged from those nests. What they did was either remove or add eggs to the nests of magpies and counted how many chicks fledged from the different manipulated clutch sizes. Um, fledging is, is simply that once the eggs are hatched, um, uh, fledglings are, are birds that have, have developed wings and can, can actually fly from the nest, but they're still um, cared for by the parent. The results of the study showed that the largest clutch size found in nature for this species was the clutch size in the experiment that fledged the most chicks. In other words, clutches with seven eggs fledged more chicks than nests with either more or fewer eggs. Based on field counts of clutch sizes in this species, they discovered that Seven eggs was actually the largest clutch size that it was found in nests in, in the natural in natural systems. So what to what determines average clutch size in birds? The quick answer to this question is that birds lay the number of eggs that will permit them to produce the maximum number of offspring. So that number can vary by latitude, habitat body size, etc., the, the answer is provided by evolutionary theory, which says that winning the game of natural selection involves producing as many surviving young as possible. A female laying too many eggs may, may lose them all, perhaps as a result of you know, simply being unable to properly care for them, like incubate them, or, or maybe um, uh, you know, they're attracting nest robbers, or, or the mother may be too weakened by the reproductive effort, um, producing so many eggs to survive the winter. Or, or simply, and this is probably most likely, they, they're um, unable to properly feed or care for their young. On the other hand, by laying too few eggs, the bird will fledge fewer young that, it, that it's capable of rearing, and, and thus not contribute enough offspring to maintain the population. So clutch size tends to be maintained around a certain number of eggs that is um, uh, evolutionarily selected for um, in species under particular environmental conditions. Now let's turn to another concept of life history that explicitly connects life history traits to environmental conditions. It's called RK selection theory. The key idea of RK selection theory is that evolutionary pressures tend to select for individuals with one or two, one of two combinations of life history traits. That is, selection favors either those who can quickly reproduce and occupy less crowded habitats, or those who reproduce slowly, invest substantially in their offspring, and who are strong competitors in crowded habitats. These are referred respectively uh, as R-selected and K-selected species. Their life history characteristics reflect two ends of a selection continuum based on the type of environment they occupy. 
car strategists are short-lived and produce lots of offspring, but make little parental investment in each. This means that each offspring has a relatively low chance of surviving to adulthood. These guys specially specialize on quickly colonizing temporarily available habitats that have relatively few competitors. At the other end of the continuum, K strategists are long lived and produce few offspring, but make high parental investment in each of those offspring. This means that each offspring has a high chance of surviving to adulthood. Because of this, K strategists are, are very good competitors and therefore able to colonize and establish in stable and thus more crowded habitats. You might be wondering what the R and the K stand for. Um, the R designation actually comes from um, rate, the word rate. In this sense, reproductive rate. So these guys, um, there's a premium on you know, reproductive output. Um, whereas K comes from uh, carrying capacity, the symbol for carrying capacity is K, and that K actually uh, is derived from the German word Kapazität, <laughs> which um, essentially means the carrying capacity. So if you're wondering where those symbols come from, that's where they come from. Each of these strategies um, reflects inherent trade-offs in the quantity of offspring, produced um, versus their quality. So which life history strategy a species has will depend upon the nature of its environment and, and therefore will affect and, and also their uh, affect its fitness. So let's, let's take a look now um, at the environment and how it can affect life history, these life history strategies. Many factors can determine the evolution of an organism's life history, but one of the most important is the unpredictability of the environment. In nature, different habitats can exhibit markedly different amounts of environmental variability. Some are highly unpredictable and others relatively stable. Relatively unpredictable habitats are, are those that experience a lot of variation in the availability of resources. Um, or they might be frequently impacted by catastrophic events like disturbances, um, such as floods, fires, or, or hurricanes. For example, rivers um, actually experience um, quite a bit of, of variation in the form of flooding um, that can range from relatively mild flood conditions that do little damage um, to very high energy flow floods that that can scour out the river course and obliterate many of its species. And, and these um, events are relatively unpredictable. Relatively stable habitats don't experience um, uh, such uh, unpredictable events um, and fluctuating resources. Uh, so these two different kinds of environments have very different um, selective, um, you know, they're very different selective kinds of environments. Unpredictable environments tend to select for organisms that produce more offspring earlier in their lives. This is because it's never really certain whether they'll survive to reproduce again. Uh, so reproductive output um, is really critical for these organisms. Because of this, the R-selected strategy tends to be selected for environments that are more unpredictable or as I indicate here, more variable environments. On the other hand, predictable or stable environments tend to select for organisms that produce uh, fewer offspring later in their lives, they have greater parental investment, and are relatively more competitive. This is because predicted predictable environments tend to be filled with many species uh, competing for very limited resources. Because of the energy allocated um, to parental care and competitive ability, the K-selected strategy tends to be more successful in these stable environments. Because the pattern of availability and resources differs between unpredictable and predictable habitats, 
That is, resources are highly variable in unpredictable habitats and relatively constant in stable ones. Populations of R strategists and K strategists actually show different types of population dynamics. By population dynamics, I mean just simply the, the, the change or fluctuation in population size over time. Um, as illustrated in this graph of population size over time, uh, with a population size on the y-axis and time on the x, our selected species tend to show a boom and bust type of cycle of, of population size over time because of the fluctuating availability of the underlying resources in their environments. That is, when resources become temporarily available, their population will increase quickly. Um, Keep in mind they have a lot of, of high ability for reproductive output. So, um, you know, high output, short generation times, they can respond very quickly to these temporary um, availability of resources. But when those resources go away, the population will crash and, and so on. Um, and you can see that reflected in this sort of boom and bust cycle. So our strategists are adapted to variable availability of resources, and this is reflected in their population dynamics. On the other hand, K-selected species tend to show a more stable population over time due to relative, relatively predictable availability of resources. Because of the stable resource base, um, K-strategist populations tend to hover in size around what's called a carrying capacity. Though we haven't talked about carrying capacity yet, it's simply the population size that the resources in the environment can support. With fewer resources, the population size is smaller. When resources are plentiful, the population size can be uh, higher. Although the population um, in case strategists may fluctuate a bit or even decline rapidly due to some kind of catastrophic event, um, it will generally return to the original carrying capacity thereafter. This is indicated in the graph by this dip in population size, but, but then the population size uh, returns after this um, decline to its former carrying capacity as indicated here. So we'll, we'll talk more about carrying capacity later when we talk about population growth. Um, but the, the point of this is to show that our strategists and case strategists have very different types of population um, dynamics dependent ultimately on the relative stability or variability of the underlying resources. So let's just take a look at a couple of, of you know, real life examples of uh, one of an R strategist and the other a K strategist. So th this is an example of um, Mycophila sperii, the midge fly. And this, and this mid fl midge fly actually feeds on the common edible mushroom, Agaricus campestris. So uh, Agaricus campestris um, fruiting bodies is, is what uh, the midge fly lays its eggs on and, and so conducts its reproductive life cycle um, you know, using this, this um, mushroom. And so the, the availability of this mushroom uh, for its reproduction is critical to its life cycle and therefore is a critical resource. But in nature, agaricus fruiting, that is the production of these fruiting bodies or sporocarps, is, is very brief and it's, it's tremendously variable. And once they do fruit, they, they, don't, stay, they, they don't stay around for very long. So the midge fly um, has, has um, adapted to this um, temporary availability of, of this resource um, through uh, evolution of life history traits that's very cued in to this type of um, you know, fluctuating resource. They have very, very short generation times for one, on the order of two weeks. So the, the, the fly um, is able to conduct its entire life cycle in, in a period of two weeks, which is strongly cued to the availability of Agaricus 
terms of its um, the timing of its fruiting. Uh, another fascinating um, adaptation is that the, the midge fly can reproduce asexually, that is parthenogenetically. Uh, so it does not need to have sexual reproduction to produce. Um, when it does produce, it produces females. Um, and of course, uh, you know, over the long term, um, you know, that's not a viable strategy, but it, it does allow the species to take advantage of this um, available resource that is very, very fleeting. Um, they can even actually reproduce um, what's called pedogenetically, and that is that um, the larvae will actually be able to produce, produce offspring. So its lifespan and its age reproduction is very, very condensed to be able to take advantage of this um, very fleeting resource. Uh, turns out these midge flies are actually um, kind of a, a, a pest in the commercial mushroom industry and, and in commercial mushroom production, uh, uh, you know, agaricus being a common mushroom that you find in, in supermarkets, uh, it's cultivated widely um, and it can reach a, a density of, uh, the midge flies can reach densities of over 20,000 reproductive larvae per square foot in commercial beds of, of mushrooms if, if the, you know, if it's not kept in check. So it can be a tremendous problem for mushroom growers. Um, other examples of our strategists are, are species like dandelions, um, you know, which is an annual, annual plant species that produces um, many um, seeds, but they're very small. Uh, many fish species are our strategists. Um, they produce a large number of, of eggs um, that are broadcast into um, you know, into the water volume. Uh, many of them don't make it, um, so uh, they produce many fairly small eggs. Uh, mosquitoes, locusts, aphids, houseflies, etc. These are all examples of our strategists. Um, elephants are, um, and as are you and I, Human beings are good examples of case strategists. That is, um, elephants are, are fairly long-lived. Well, they're very long-lived. They, they can live to around 70 years or so. Uh, they become reproductive at around 18 or 20 years, and then they um, produce offspring over a, a period of a number of decades, generally to around 50 years of age. And when they do produce offspring, they produce very few offspring with lots of parental care. So elephants uh, and other large mammals that, that have similar K types of characteristics live in habitats that are relatively stable in terms of their resource base. So they exhibit um, relatively low reproductive rates, at least on a per reproduction production event basis, delayed reproduction, um, Human beings don't re become reproductive until you know teenage years. Elephants, as I mentioned, you know around 18 or 20 years. Um, K strategists are very long lived and they have a relatively high degree of parental care. Other examples of K strategists are are whales, sharks, um, many primates. Uh, even um, a number of plant species, including ginseng, uh, and and many canopy tree species in in tropical rainforests that uh, produce relatively few seeds, but they're they're large um, and have lots of, of energy reserve. So, those are two different um, examples of um, uh, one of our strategists, the other of case strategists, and that concludes the lecture on life history.